right. Hello all. Welcome to Living Figuratively with your host, moi, Judy Takas. Um, this is the show that asks the question, why not fill your home with the fascinating faces and figures of people that you don't even know in the form of figurative art? Um, each week, I'm going to do a little bit of a spotlight on one piece instead of like what I did a couple weeks ago where I walked through the house and showed you 10 different pieces just to keep it a little bit simpler. Um, and I'm going to spotlight one piece either from my, my art collection or from one of, my own, one of my own pieces. Today I'm kicking it off with this painting called Serenity Prayer, which has its Serenity Prayer Acceptance which has a major message for our times right now when the serenity prayer is one that, uh, that really plays into what's going on today. Um, if you don't remember, or if you've never been in AA, or you've never had occasion to hear it, I'm gonna repeat the serenity prayer again. It is the one that goes, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Um, this painting, four years ago, is what is when I painted it, and the uh, the Serenity Prayer really, you know, played into things. The actually, I, one of the I'm going to backtrack a little bit. The the Serenity Prayer, you don't actually have to ask God for it. You can ask any number of people. You can ask Jesus. You can ask Moses. You can ask Apollo. You can ask. Dionysus, you can ask Ganesha, you can ask even just your own better, smarter self to grant you that wisdom. Um, and right now it's a very pertinent thing because we are um, basically with all the quarantines and lockdowns and stuff like that, we're basically told to sit home and accept it. And um, and you know, sit home and do nothing while we watch our businesses fall apart, while we watch our favorite restaurant go out of business, while we worry about the people we love, while we worry about the people we can't see, while we get a little bit tired of the people that we see too much of, while we plan our trips to the grocery store. One of my favorite um, internet memes about that is like, we plan our trips to the grocery store the way they do a uh, supply run on The Walking Dead. So if anybody knows what that's like, it's, it's a little bit scary. Um, so basically the serenity prayer concept kind of plays, in, plays into things today. But four years ago when I did this, we had no idea that you know Corona was going to be on the horizon. Four years ago when I painted this, it was part of my own personal personal struggle and chaos and everything where I had to um, basically accept what I couldn't change. Um, I painted it during a time of great personal stress when both my parents were in the hospital, flip-flopping back and forth between, you know, one in the cancer ward, one in the regular ward. Um, and it started kind of a six-month healthcare hell that ended up with uh, both my parents passing away. And um, during that time, the serenity prayer really, really kicked in. And, you know, I kind of discovered what, what the meaning of the things that you can't change are, which are many of the healthcare issues. But the painting itself began before that. Um, maybe a few months before that, I had my, one of my favorite, favorite models, who was also a jewelry artist, Kim Mati. She actually made these earrings that I have on right now um, from repurposed, my, my mom's jewelry repurposed because I gave, them, gave her a whole bunch of my mom's jewelry and she made it into some gorgeous stuff. Um, and she's also just incidentally, she's having a trunk show, a virtual trunk show because that's kind of the things we're doing right now on uh, April 30th. So, but I'll be posting more about that. So you'll, you know, you'll be able to find out more about that. But she is also a fabulous model for me. And I had her come over and pose for a concept, a painting concept that started with 
three different items that I found in antique stores. The, sometimes my painting process is where I think of a great concept and then I go looking for the props and the costumes. Other times I go looking for things in antique stores and stumble upon things and then they kind of inspire the concepts. So my concept was three different approaches to tackling your problems. Um, the three different approaches are the boxer, the bowler, and the beekeeper. So the boxer approach to problems is where you come out fighting. You put on your boxing gloves, you're ready, you're fighting, you're, you know, you're, you're going at them, whole hog. The bowler concept is where you take your aim, you strategize, you figure out the best way to do it, and then, I'm not going to throw this because then my cameraman will be hurt and probably my house will be hurt too. So that's the uh, boxer, the boxer concept. And then the third one is the beekeeper concept where you basically put on your beekeeper helmet, you hide, you take things as they come, and you hope that they will work out for the best if you kind of don't do much about it. So those are my three concepts. Um, the, bo the boxer one was the one that intrigued me the most because these, I love these red boxing gloves. These were just like such a cool, you know, antique store find. They're from the 1970s. And um, I actually did the painting for that very, right away, very quickly because it was so, you know, it was such a compelling concept. Um, and it's the one that's up in the, top right the red one because facebook live can't zoom it's hard to zoom into it but maybe i'll talk about it another time and it's also up high and she's also available and she's not coming down unless somebody buys her um so i did the the boxer one almost immediately because it was it was really fun and uh and i i approached it the way and not even so much like a fighting way, but more of a ready, ready for anything kind of thing. Like where she's ready and waiting. She doesn't want to fight, but she will if she has to. The bowler one is still in the folder, even four years later. It just somehow never clicked. But when I say folder, um, the that's, that's what I do with my paintings. When I get a painting concept, I make a folder for it. And I collect my thoughts in there. I collect reference photos, I, you know, scribble down concepts and the folders there ready for me whenever I want it. So I never say, ooh, what am I gonna paint? Because I can just go to my many folders. Right now I probably have about 30 folders that have paintings that could be done, but they haven't been done yet. So the, the uh, Buller one never made it. The Beekeeper one, I never got super excited about because I love a good face and when I have to hide the face, it's, it's not so exciting for me, even though, you know, I can focus on hands, which is, which is really, really cool. But during this time, the, you know, my parental health care hell thing happened. And while that was going on, the beekeeper concept really kind of clicked home because I felt myself wanting to hide from all the chaos in that was going on. Um, but you know, I couldn't. And I also realized that the beekeeper painting needed bees. So I added the bees to the painting and it really kind of made the whole thing click together. It made it sort of like where now here's the, the conflagration, the chaos, the, the thing that she's hiding from. And I loved painting the bees. They were so, so super fun. Um, they're these little imperishable spices of little flourishes of fun. Um, whenever you're painting something like that, you do a lot of wiping out because you want your one little bead to be very spontaneous and sort of just right. You don't want it to be too belabored, too contrived, or too sloppy because it can get really sloppy when, you, you know, when you're trying to be all like a genius that just sneezed onto the canvas. Um, so there was a lot of wiping out, but I got, you know, enough bees on there to make it interesting. I even, you know, got some nice bees, uh, you know, casting the shadow on her face, which I thought was, you know, a very nice effect. 
Um, one of the other things that I really loved about this painting was the hands. The, the general concept where she is essentially doing what we're doing right now, which is sheltering in space, in place, sheltering in place, where you are still exposed. You know, your, her arms are still exposed, her, her body is still exposed. She's trying to protect herself as best she can, but there's all kinds of chaos going on in the world. And um, to me, that is one of the beauties of figurative art, where the, your personal feelings, the personal feelings that one artist, one human being can have, are also universal. Because even though the situations are the same, like this personal situation here was, you know, four years ago before Corona, it applies four years later to the chaos. I think it will apply in a hundred years to other chaos that we're having in a hundred years. You know, it's the it's the feeling of it and the the personal that transcends um, into the universal that is one of the wonderful things about figurative art to me, and hopefully, hopefully to you too. Hopefully, you will start looking at figurative art and seeing how the personal things that you see, the the individual human beings, the individual feelings of those human beings can translate into your life and into what, what you're feeling. Um, this painting actually had a sister painting as well because sometimes when I get a good concept and I really like painting it, I do several views and make sort of a diptych out of it. Her sister painting was actually acquired and into its forever home a couple years ago um, by somebody who's, who had lost her own mom. And so she totally clicked with, with the feeling. And I thought that was just a beautiful, you know, full circle type situation. Um, with, figurative, with figurative art, with this one especially, this one is still, is still available. And uh, she is $3,200. And I will send her wherever you are in the United States, the continental United States. And um, I can also make a half-size G-clay, which is a fancy word for a high-quality print, which a half-size G-clay would only be about this big, and I would send it shipped, rolled, signed, and um, to your doorstep. It'll be in a roll for $195. My pledge to you at this during this corona time is that I will take 50% of the profits from any art sales that I make during this time and pay it forward into the art, the struggling art community. The struggling art community is, it's struggling because basically the first thing to go, in these sort of economically stressful times and uncertain times, the first thing to go is art purchases. Not only that, people are canceling workshops. I mean, there are, I have many friends who have schools, you know, artists who have schools, who have had workshops canceled, like their whole curriculum is canceled, or they are um, invited to teach workshops, which is a major source of their income, and those have been canceled. Uh, art fairs are being canceled right and left. The Columbus Art Fair this summer is being canceled. Um, art shows where, you know, some artists rely on those completely for, you know, for their income, those are canceled. So there's, and models, my models have had all their modeling gigs canceled because there's no more life drawing classes because all the schools are closed. So I will pay forward 50% of my profits in back into the art, art community, the struggling art community. Um, so message me, email me, judytakis at me.com. And uh, if you are interested in any, in uh, serenity prayer. Now, I wanted to give you another tiny piece of good information, good, whatever, good news, because this whole corona thing is really a um, flip-flop of awesomes and awfuls that I've found. There's awful things happening, and there's awesome things happening. And one of the awesome things that's happening, my show at, my Chicks with Balls show at the Zanesville Museum of Art right now, which is closed, so like the show is just sitting there closed, has been extended, held over through July 18th. These postcards have had many stickers on them because there's been so many changes, but this is my favorite sticker, held over through July 18th. So 
hopefully knock on, I'm going to knock on all kinds of wood. The um, art museum will open back up again sometime in June because we will have gone through the flattened curve of Corona and things will be better. And then you can maybe head on downstate to go to go see it uh, before July 18th. And just as a little tiny FYI, a lot of Ohio art museums have been practicing social distancing for years and years and years before it was even a cool thing. Every time I go to an Ohio art museum, with the possible exception of the Cleveland Museum of Art, which is quite big and popular, there's nobody there. There's literally nobody there. I walk into a gallery. If there's one other person there, it's a miracle. Usually there isn't. Usually there's maybe like six or seven people in the museum at the at, at one time, in the whole museum. It's the greatest place to practice social distancing. So when they open back up again, that might be the first place that you want to go. Of course, you know, everybody might think that. So I don't know. We'll see. But thus far, they've been very, very uncrowded. So thank you very much. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching Living Figuratively. Tune in next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. I'm going to use that phrase because I like it. Um, six o'clock next Thursday night when next week I will be talking about ephemera. E-P-H-E-M-E-R-A. Look it up. You can even look it up on my website. See what I'm going to have to say about it. All right. See you next week. Bye-bye.